Welcome to the Focus on Me channel. My name is Daniel Arroyo. Uh, for those that do not know me, for those that do know me, thank you for sticking around. This is my opportunity to give back to the community a little bit of things that I have learned and some experience that I have gained along the way. Um, I'm trying to reinvoke that old adage, be strong to be useful. So in this episode, I would like to discuss longevity and the aspects of it, the who, what, why, where, and how of the many facets that have to do with longevity and what makes longevity you know, a healthy individual that's gonna last for a long time, somebody that's been doing parkour for 15 plus years over the age of 30, um, that could fit the parameters of still discovering, still exploring, and still expanding themselves. Um, so these are some of the things that we're gonna explore. Um, like for instance, where your environment is, is, is highly important. If you're in Europe, it's gonna be easier for you to develop due to the fact that the building density, like their architecture is so condensed that it enables individuals to walk outside and just find a spot. Here in America, it's not like that. It's it's a little bit uh, spaced out, a little bit, a lot spaced out. Um, the nearest city to me is an hour away. The nearest community that's really well established is four hours away. So that's like a heavy, heavy journey. Whereas if you're over there, you can walk outside in, in Europe anywhere and your immediate community has 10 plus people or more training as well as you have the environment that facilitates that. So the progression is gonna be naturally more um, suited for them. However, then weather plays an important part. So in Florida, where I'm at, it's, it's very hot. I, we could train all year round. So you have all these different pros and cons to everything that we do. So we have to measure them in terms of longevity. The first person to come to mind is Sebastian Pucan. Uh, I believe he's 47, he's from France. Um, he's one of the pioneers, forefathers of this discipline. And uh, parkour is quite an amazing discipline in terms of movement because it was internet born. Not many disciplines are internet born. So when you look at something that's internet born, it, it, you can see such a fast spike of progression within the discipline of parkour versus other disciplines because they were more uh, word of mouth and then passing on slowly like that, where this is just like, we have the internet so we could just jump on, see everything. And we are actually a part of other, other communities that we're not really directly physically involved in. Um, so these are amazing aspects to see parkour because we can look at our pioneers that are still actively involved and it allows us to get a better understanding of this longevity. Going back to Sebastian Pucan, he's still training. I'll put his name right here, show some uh, images of him, you know, still being an awesome individual that's still playing and finding uh, new roots in order to continue this movement because movement is life. If you're not moving, you're not really alive, I guess. You're not exchanging with your environment. So yeah, let's keep going. He's not the only one. Um, from China, I just recently discovered this guy named Sanjay. Uh, and Sanjay is like, I believe he's 47, 41, 41. So Sanjay is 41 years old and he is amazing. Um, I'll show some of his clips if I can find it, but um, we don't hear a lot of uh, stories or video or see a lot of footage about people from China due to the fact of you know, how they're all arranged in terms of their culture and community. So we miss out on a lot of individuals, which is another really important part because uh, that I wanna bring up uh, is, it's uh, interesting when I traveled uh, uh, for a, a tour for, for parkour and I got to meet individuals, I got to learn a lot. I got to see that there's some beast in private that they don't really come out and show what they can do, but they're so, so good that it's just like, how do people not know about you? And I'm pretty sure that other people that are well-traveled or well-versed in terms of culture, they're gonna experience this too. And it it, bring, it, it kind of humbled me in a way that I was like, wow, okay, there's, there's people out here that are just amazing and they don't know any different. They're not striving to be seen. They're not striving for attention in those kind of ways. So they kind of just are in this discovery mode keep going on. In America, we have Howard P. Uh, Palmer, Howard Palmer Cosmo, um, a good friend of mine from Atlanta, um, helped develop that community, lives in uh, Colorado right now. And he, I spent three hours talking to him about longevity and his aspects of it and, and what we can do to help the, the community of the future as well as the community uh, that's been here forever. Okay, so let's do a real quick recap on people that are over the age of 30 and have been training for 15 plus years. Um, Sanjay from China, Beijing, awesome individual. F check him out, awesome. Uh, Sebastian Vacan, 47, France. Johan LaRue, 35, France. Dair Sanchez, 35, Mexico. Paul Blue Joseph, 39, UK. Um, Oliver Thrope, I think he just turned 30, UK. Um, interested to see how he progresses too because he was always so fast and fluid with his movement. Uh, Bay, bio, bye, 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 boo, bye, bye. 
Have you ever had a dream that that you um you had you 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 could you do you you want you you could do so you you do Christmas. Fifty UK London. Um, I think Jimmy the Giant did a, a, a thing about him and a few others have as well. Uh, he's not a genetic anomaly. Don't want to hear all that stuff. Everybody I'm naming to this is a multiplicity of genetic anomalies, I guess, then, because we have white people, black people, Latins, Asians, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, let's keep going. Um, uh, Howard Palmer, U.S., he's 40 years old. And me, 34, um, U.S., been training for eight, 18 plus years, um, so on and so forth. Started when I was like 18. So, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Leave a comment below if I missed anybody. I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, there are some other people, actually, Hold on, let me, before I continue on. So, Philly D turned 30, uh, he's from Great Britain. By, by Turin, uh from Russia, 32. Eric Mukamechin, he's 30. You guys already know who he is, still killing it. Oleg Vorslav, to Cherepko from Russia. I think I said his name right, Cherepko. Um, I believe he's, a, he's older too. Mark his age, because I don't know his age, but I know for sure he's over 30. And I, from what I hear from the Russians, he's been in the game forever. Um, Joey Adrian, he actually turned 30 in May 25th. So as we find ourselves uh, continuing on the discussion, we kind of split ourselves into an intention. Like, why do you train? If we'll go back to that, like what makes you do what you do? Um, and what I have boiled it down to is a spectrum. I mean, it's like a, a spectrum of, of light, of colors. Um, so it's a spectrum of approach. Um, some people are approaching life from a discovery mindset, and some people are approaching life from a competitive mindset. We're gonna go over to the real course, and if you beat me over there, not only are you on the team, but I won't f with you anymore, and I'll call you by your real name. There's gonna be exceptions, like people might be approaching from both at different points of their life, so on and so forth, and that is absolutely happening. But if we can understand the polarity of these things, the duality of it, we can understand where we are approaching any given circumstance, like where we're approaching from, like our origin. Because I believe where you're approaching things in life from uh, is, is very important to how you're treating your body, how you're treating your mind, how you're taking care of yourself, and how that applies to your adaptability for the long run. Um, so going into this whole discovery versus a competitive mindset set that I've been noticing, um, let's dive into that. A discovery mindset is uh, generally more interested in self-awareness. They're not as trying to push to be seen. They're just so interested in self-awareness and self-awareness is a slow progress. It's not something that is instantaneously, it's not instant gratification. So they're not as seen as often or it takes a longer time for those kind of people to blossom. Then you have a competitive mindset that's more so a fast progress because they have their goal, they're goal oriented. They have a mission about themselves. And that mission is to be the best that they could be or to be better than other people or th their competition is with self or with others, but it's still a comp competition mindset. What we don't understand in, in our push to see what we can do, our, limitless, our limited but limitless potentials, um, we don't realize how hard we are on the body. Um, and what I mean by hard on, hard on the body is the body takes like the hard tissues or the, the, the subtle tissues like the bone and then the articular cartilage. It takes about seven years for those to recruit the necessary elasticity for tendons and densities for bones um, for it to recruit enough to be able to take a lot of this impact. Some of the heavier impacts required for these more advanced moves when you're landing and as you're landing and twisting at the same time the cartilage has to be able to hold the skeletal structure in alignment and so on and so forth your body has to work in unison um a lot of the times when you have a competitive mind you're just pushing 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 you're not really focused on the proper body mechanics the proper care the proper rest the proper all these other aspects um so that leads to an overload um, um, which can be very, very hard on the body, which is counterintuitive to longevity. So I don't wanna say it's a bad thing because sometimes when you have a competitive mindset, you can also, you're not paralyzed by fear as much as a discovery mindset. Since they're in a slower progress, they approach fear from a, okay, I can greet you later kind of thing. Um, and some people read it later so much that they never end up greeting it. So the competitive mindset also helps to garner this courageous approach towards fear. So you can not be paralyzed by it and you can thrive in uh, within attention. So when you're thriving within attention, it, it allows you to have higher forms of expression, not um, self-conscious forms of expression where you're insecure and you're uncertain. You, you, wanna, be fo you wanna be moving from a sense of, of focus, attention, and certainty, um, um, but ready for the unknowns. 
So that kind of balanced mindset really, really helps. But the competitive mindset and the discovery mindset help to establish a sense of balance approach together. Um, for instance, Dom Tommaso, um, he approached things very competitively with himself or with other people. I think it's more so with himself, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Dom, write in the comments or something like that. But regardless of that, what he does is he approaches things very courageously. He sees fear and he realizes that that's the area that he needs to work on in his life or in that area or in that movement or whatever that case might be. And when he conquers it, he gets a sense of accomplishment. You know, he gets another sense of confidence and he reestablishes a sense of certainty about himself. Um, and when he fails, he I, I like the way he deduces that he was too gung ho about something. In America, we have go big or go home. So sometimes when I see him, I see that kind of attitude that go big or go home. But I love the way that he is developing creative approaches towards bigger movements and things that make you say like, maybe we shouldn't be training like that. But the way he goes about it shows a creative approach. So he brings another discovery aspect to it, which I find very intriguing, but he is still dominantly a competitive mindset. Where let's think of a, a person that's not competitive mindset, Oleg Borislav. Oleg didn't want to film any of his videos. Uh, it was his friend that kind of influenced him and pushed him to film these things because he was like, Oleg, you have something to show. Oleg did not care at all. Um, through all my talkings with Oleg, Oleg does not care to be filmed. He does not care to express himself in terms of garnering attention or instant gratification or inflating his ego. He doesn't care about that. And what I find the most amazing thing is he does the most creatively amazing things. Uh, I don't know if it's just the discovery mindset that unleashes a kind of creative sense that is super heightened, highly heightened, and you have to be around it to experience, but it definitely puts you in a place that is beyond just the attention of self. So he really activates himself. And if it wasn't for his friend recording him, he would have never been filmed. So that's a, a con of, about, I, I would say, about the discovery mindset is because he has such a phenomenal gift that we can we all learn from and that we all have grew up watching and being inspired by. Um, but he was just so in his own self-discovery that he wasn't really pushing to, to, to show it like that. Uh, it, it ended up being so luckily enough and we got to see Russian Climber and so many other things, him on the MTV show, uh, us on the MTV show and everything of that sort. Um, and he still is doing amazing things. It's just, he doesn't you know, show it a, a, enough like that. So, I mean, for me, and maybe I'm just speaking selfishly because you know, he's an incredible mover. He's not the only one. Ilabak is another one where you can see him come out with a video and you're just like, okay, look, he hasn't lost it. It has nothing to do with that. But everything it has to do with is your interest for filming yourself, your interest for marketing yourself that's kind of what it's become about since it's an internet sensation um you're marketing thing and that's why you, you see parkour is much more than just about parkour or movement it involves things beyond parkour when we get into parkour we don't even really realize that we need to learn how to film and how to edit and how to get a good shot or how to select the right shot since most of us use dslrs these are interesting things that parkour forces upon you um, in a not, in not non-pressuring way, in a good way, in a way. Um, but it expands you. Um, I could say from my own experience that parkour has helped me tremendously th like that because knowing all these things whenever I, I was in the entertainment business and in the movies and things like that, it helped me to be more aware of what was needed from the director, the, uh, the second AD or whoever the, might, the DP, whoever it might be, uh, stunt coordinator. It allows you to be of assistance to everybody. And then you become more harmonious with the bigger picture. So it goes back to community always in a sense, when you think about these things, parkour, self-development, it kind of comes back to this communal sense is what I'm essentially getting to within terms of longevity and keeping your motivation, keeping your interest and keeping your attention on the right things because they're all gonna shift simultaneously as you live life. Okay, let's jump into this. So here are the seven pillars of longevity in which, in which I see them. All right, one is to educate yourself. Here, educate yourself. You need to educate yourself about the human body, about the foundational movements of a discipline, about working out, about um, psychology, <laughs> if, you, if you care about longevity. Um, educate yourself and have it be an active education. Don't have it get to a point where you read one book and you think you know everything. Um, information is constantly changing, evolving, shaping, and we need to stay with the current forms of it or at least with it, an openness to receiving uh, adjustments towards our misalignments with current information. The second pillar is gonna to be to perfect practice. It's, you can practice a lot, but it doesn't mean you're following the right body mechanics. It doesn't mean that you're understanding how to properly do a move or what makes the movement so. 
um, perfect practice helps you to garner uh, muscle memory and, and develop longevity because you can have those uh, tendons and muscles and your nervous system, your CNS firing in the right sequences in order for you to do more work with less, with less um, energy. To first get into any discipline, we'll talk about parkour, but any discipline, you have to learn the foundational movements and establish rules for that discipline, no matter what that discipline is. Parkour has to be the foundational vaults, the precisions, wall, uh, wall climb ups or like wall runs and climb ups um, and so on and so forth. Those are foundational movements in terms of parkour and, and movement in general. So understanding that is the basis for you getting into the sport. After you become well versed within that, you be, you've evolved to the next kind of thing, which is you creatively modify established rules and traits or rules and limitations, I'd say, or movements. So you take those movements and you evolve them. So when I first got into it, everybody was Konging from two feet. They were double punching on their Kongs. And then we started developing a split foot Kong and things of that nature and Konging to striding. And so we started taking the established techniques and we started creatively uh, improvising upon them. That's the second step. The third step is when you become so well-versed in yourself, your movement, and aside from the discipline itself, you develop a sense of awareness that's ready for absolutely anything. I call it improvisational movement, where you can improv on cue. You're ready for anything. If I do this stride and I come up short, I know how to bounce back. If I over jump it, I know I need to grab the rail if there's a drop. If I'm doing that, you, you have these constant understandings of calculations of compensation. A whole lot of stuff made my mind blow up right there. <laughs> calculations of comp <laughs> of computations and that helps you to adapt essentially okay without thinking so you don't have to think to do these things they become second nature and they're just there that's the third form of it so impro improvisational movement um these are the natural things for all movements in anything that you get into and this is why parkour is so monumental because it made me get into so many other movements it goes third is balance of rest mobility breath work and meditation um, you, I feel like those are very, very overlooked aspects of movement. Breathing is a very overlooked aspect. You could change your way of breathing and it will enable you to recruit more oxygen or recruit more power, recruit what's necessary for you to achieve whatever it is you're desiring to achieve. Um, and that just comes from breathing alone. If we learn that those kind of aspects, it will apply to our movement. You need balance of rest because when you're doing so much activity, you need to have the, the, the dualistic aspect of it, the antagonist of it, the protagonist, however you want to look at it in terms of polarity, you need to do the opposite. So if I do push-ups, I need to do back rows. I need to work on my back so my system can be balanced. If I do um, Kongs with my left foot, I need to split to the other leg and become, you know, do Kongs with my right foot. Bob Reese is amazing at this. This is actually a perfect opportunity for me. Give me him a sh shout out. Bob Reese is an individual that practices both sides of everything. Not many people practice both sides of things. That makes him have a higher chance of longevity. As we start developing, we don't take enough rest to balance out our bodies um, or do and do mobility training to understand our imbalances. If we always do corks that way, we're gonna overdevelop our muscle structure from doing corks that way. If I only stride off my right foot, I'm only gonna develop my mobility and understanding of my, my pendulum swing through from my right foot and my muscles will develop accordingly. So we have to understand that balance of, of, of sorts. And if you don't, it will lead to a decline in terms of your longevity. So fourth thing is diet. Um, diet is super, super important. Um, in coordination with diet is fasting. And then in coordination with fasting is your understanding of your water intake and nutrition. If you don't understand your diet, your fasting, your water intake and your nutrition, I, I, I don't know, really know what to tell you in terms of longevity because those are essential. What you're eating, what you're drinking and how often you're doing these things is, is, is essential to how long you span out your life. Um, there's been studies to show about fasting, for instance, which is the opposite of what I'm saying in terms of eating, is that sometimes when you eat too much, um, it eats, eats away at your, uh, your, the bacteria in your stomach uh, that aids in digestion um, because you overused it. So your DNA replication isn't as, uh, it, it's, it's overloaded, so it's super important. Um, all those things are important to the nutrition and how you nourish your body. Um, the nutrients that you're giving your body, um, whether it be you know from the sun or whether it be from what you're putting in your mouth or whether it be from the water itself, since we're 80% uh, 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 70, some of us, then we're not getting enough water. 70% or more of water, um, it's really important, these things, 
So I encourage everybody to explore and learn as much as they can about diet and how what diet might best relate to you because I'm not going to say which is best or anything like that because it really doesn't matter. What's be what best works for you? There's many paths up the same mountain. It's what is your path and what works for you in terms of are you a fast oxidizer, slow oxidizer, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's four. Five is going to be your mental and emotional care. How are you caring for yourself? Um, are you understanding that mental and emotional care are an important aspects of development and not just in movement, but also in terms of life? If you can see the correlation between them two, if you're insecure, you're not going to move as good. That's an emotional aspect. If you believe that everybody's against you, you're not going to want to move. So those, those things, your mental and emotional uh, understandings are very, very important to how you move and to terms of the limitations you place upon yourself <laughs> from, from these things. So um, I encourage everybody to learn a little bit of mental health practices and healing practices, whether it be psychology or whether it be you believe in doing meditation um, or whatever the case might be, learn some sort of healing practice that works best for you. Six, um, fear and envy are the roots of misalignment. I, I can say that like so much in I, every aspect I can explain how fear and envy are the roots of misalignment in community, in our community, and just in terms of your own movement. Um, there's so many times where people want to be leaders, but then they become envious of others. I kind of went out, uh, along this earlier, but it still uh, applies to the same aspect. So it's uh, I, I encourage you to really learn a lot about fear and envy within yourself and how you relate with your environment, um, because essentially it could fall. It falls down to identity. Let's finish this off with our last pillar being number seven, and that is be humble enough to teach the next generation that's willing to learn. Um, you could be talented, you could be so, so talented, but if you're not passing this off or being of service to others, what good are you to a community? How can you say you really care about community if you're not giving gifts that apply to it? Same thing for me, that's why I'm making this channel. I care about the community, so I wanna give something which I don't get anything from it, but I want to give a little bit of understanding, a perspective maybe, my own perspective, that can help other people that uh, want to learn these things or that are in this for longevity. Um, or that it might be in this for the competitive mind and it still helps them to understand why they have a competitive mind. So this still will help the community overall through, through the diversity of it, of substance. So those are the seven pillars. Uh, let me know what you think about the seven pillars. Are there any you would like to add to this? Or are there any that you would take away from this? Tell me what you think, you know, write it down in the comments. Um, I'm, I'm anxious to see how people are receptive to all these things. This moves me to the next thing. After discussing these seven pillars, it makes me really go into identity. What is your identity fixated on? Are you fixated on your material appearance? Are you fixated on your nation? Uh, do you have pride of your bloodline, your belief system? There are so many things uh, to be prideful of and to formulate a, an identity around. Um, and it's important to see where your identity is based towards. Because if you do not understand identity and you don't understand how you have your own identity, then you are gonna be a slave to who you're around. Meaning you'll start being easily influenced by whatever culture or place you're around, which is a good, it's an adaptability thing and that's why we have it. But it's also, it leads to lack of individuation, lack of your own creative, creative embracement. Um, and what I mean by creative embracement, just loving who you are aside from the crowd, um, um, if you're not like the crowd, that's okay. It doesn't mean you have to be accepted by the crowd in order for you to continue to express yourself. And this is what leads to mental health decline and, and suicide and so many other things. And this is why I'm talking about it because it, it has so much to do with longevity and how we are a community with each other. Um, so is your identity fixated on your pride, your appearance, your nation, your belief, your bloodline, or is your identity fixated on consciousness itself? Consciousness itself is the unif unification factor, I would say, a unifying factor of all of us. So we all are consciously aware. Um, that's, a, that's, that's beyond appearance. If we can understand that, that would get us past all these racism, sexism, um, all these isms of division that um, separate us from each other, from our communion. Um, and that's what breeds fear and envy. you envious of others or you fear others because they don't look like you. We want to see things in our image before we can readily accept them. And this is what happens in melting pots like America. And this is why we have racism still talked about, let's say like that, heavily talked about in terms of it because it's it, it goes with how we embrace each other. Different cultures aren't gonna embrace each other as easily. This is common sense, but we are looking at it from a lens of unconsciousness, which makes it really complex and complicated because there's 
inherent trauma buried in people and it does have to be recognized but at the same time we also have to recognize how to embrace the diversity not how to separate the diversity we need to understand how to embrace each other because that's what makes a community and if we can embrace each other then we can talk about these things and not in such an ugly traumatized manner but in a way where we can release these burdens and anchors and we could have healing not just reliving traumatic experiences that we aren't necessarily currently going through Oh, thank you for taking your time. If you made it this far, I appreciate all the time you're giving me. Let me know down in the comments what you liked about this episode, what you thought was different than the other things that you have seen, what you might want to see in the next episode, or maybe something that you don't like or something that you don't want to see or anything of that nature. You know, give me your feelings, your comments, your thoughts, your logic, your intuition, whatever you want to give me. Put it in the comments. If you look down below and you like the music that you were hearing on this on, on this episode, make sure you please click the link and then support the channel by uh, purchasing the album. There's gonna be two albums. There's gonna be a one in hip hop album and there's gonna be another one that's dedicated to future soul or lo-fi style electronic music. Um, whichever one you, t you, you like, go ahead and please uh, support the link. Click it again below and that will help out a lot um, for future editions, whether it be like a mic for um, this channel because people really like the channel or it be, I don't know, trips so I can see some other people that I want to make part of this um, type of direction. Let me know, but peace.